Hey there, and welcome back to Clean Technica TV. 10 second channel announcement here. Uh, from now on, Clean Technica will on occasion publish their webinars on this channel as well. So don't be surprised when you see those. And uh, I think the first one is coming out the same day as this video. So with all of that out of the way, today we are going to be analyzing everything that Tesla announced on AI Day that is related to the Dojo supercomputer. In case you haven't yet, I would highly recommend that you also watch my pre AI Day video because everything that I explained about how Tesla Autopilot works still completely holds up. Even all the predictions that I made in that video turned out to be correct. And in fact, I even danced around the fact that Tesla could now build a real world AI for robots and asked why they don't, as well as explained the benefits of them building robots. So I was pleasantly surprised when they announced their intentions to build humanoid robots. But that was the last video. And in this video, we're going to be focusing on computer hardware. Fair warning, a lot of this is still rather technical, but I will do my very best to translate it all into plain English. And if you still have any questions left, please leave them down in the comments below. Also, this is part one. Uh, I, the whole thing became a little long, so I divided it into two parts. And the second half is coming out the day after that this video will be published. Having said all that, let's dive right in. The GPU stack. So the first thing Tesla talked about is their current supercomputers. They have three clusters. Um, this graph shows the pace at which they were built. The first and second clusters are made up of either NVIDIA Quadro RTX cards, which are actually more geared towards workstations, or the older V100 GPUs that still, up to today, make up the second and third most powerful supercomputers in the world. If the V100 GPUs, then that second cluster would be at the bottom edge of uh, the supercomputer top 15 list. Then stack three is made up of the new NVIDIA A100 GPUs. All this time, they have been sitting on the fifth most powerful supercomputer in the world and they didn't tell anyone. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. Uh, Andre Carpathy shared it in a presentation somewhere near the end of June. Sadly, the metrics he shared don't give us a precise answer as to how good uh, it is compared to other supercomputers. But if our estimates are correct, then with 90 petaflops, it is the fifth place and really close to the fourth place. Then we get to Dojo. That is Tesla's next supercomputer that they are just starting to produce and put together. So at first glance, it might appear that with 1.1 exaflop, this would become the most powerful supercomputer in the world. However, Tesla, well, they sugarcoated the numbers a bit, and Dojo will in fact become the 11th most powerful supercomputer in the world. Now, if you have seen my analysis article, I said that Dojo will be 5th or 6th, but because of a mix-up, I forgot to divide the result by 2. I will explain more about this later on and what to look out for not to make this kind of mistake or other mistakes that are even easier to make when comparing flop performance. Right now, the most powerful supercomputer is the Fugaku in Kobe, Japan, and it has a world record of 442 petaflops. Three times faster than the second most powerful supercomputer, called Summit in Tennessee, USA, uh, which has 148.6 petaflops. Nonetheless, this is nothing to laugh at. In fact, when it comes to the tasks that Tesla needs a supercomputer for, it is very likely that Dojo will outperform all other supercomputers out there and by a healthy margin. You see, the standard test for a supercomputer, well, it's like peeling apples, but Tesla has a yard full of oranges and designed a tool for that. So the mere fact that in addition to being the best in the world at peeling oranges, it is still able to get 11th place for peeling apples, that just shows how incredible this system is. Moving away from raw compute performance, Dojo and its jaw-dropping engineering puts all other supercomputers to shame in every other way possible. To logically explain this, we need to start at the small scale. So what is an SOC? The way every computer works right now is you have a processor, the CPU, the brain of the computer. In some cases, a business server might even have two of them installed on the same silicon board called a motherboard. Uh, that motherboard also houses the RAM, that's a temporary fast memory, something like eight to 16 gigabytes in good laptops and desktops. And most 
Computers will have then a separate power supply that feeds electricity into the motherboard to power everything. Most consumer desktops have a separate graphics card, a GPU, but most consumer processors also have a built-in graphics card. Now, if you haven't read it yet, you may want to read my previous article in which I analyzed Tesla's hardware 3 chip. Elon Musk on Twitter actually called it a good analysis, so you can't go wrong there. But to very quickly summarize, the Tesla hardware 3 chip and most consumer processors are actually an SOC or a system on a chip uh, because they include stuff like cache memory, only a few megabytes, but that's actually quite a bit, uh, as well as a processor and a graphics card. And for example, in the case of the Tesla hardware 3 chip, it also has two NPUs or neural processing units. Wafer and wafer yield. Now, before we move on, I need to explain something about how processors, graphics cards, and SOCs are made. You see, all of the components, like transistors, they are not added onto individual processors. They are added on while the processor is still part of a circular disk called a wafer, which you can see in the image above. Uh, that wafer is then cut into pieces, each of which becomes an individual processor, GPU, or SOC. The chip fabrication does not always go well, and often some processors don't work or are only partially operational. In the industry, the common term to describe this issue is a low wafer yield. Even most people who don't know much about computer hardware know that Intel offers a lineup of processors, uh, Celeron, Pentium, i3, i5, i7, i9, and that order that I just named was from weakest to strongest, what most people don't know is that due to problems with, with wafer yield, some of those processors are defective. They work only partially. So what they do is they disable the broken part of the chip and sell it as a cheaper version. This is called binning. So a Celeron or Pentium are sometimes a broken i3 and an i5 is actually sometimes a broken i7. Not always, but this is something that they do. And even within chips, uh, there are still various versions of an i5 and i7. Some that can't reach their maximum clock speed are locked and sold as a cheaper variant of that chip. Whether Intel still does this with their latest generation of chips today, I'm actually not certain, but they still did this as recently as 2017. The point is that rather than throw out a whole defective wafer or defective chips within a wafer, you can still salvage your yield. Tesla breaks the rules. What Tesla is planning to do with its dojo training tiles is screw the whole industry standard of cutting the wafer into pieces. It is just going to leave 25 SOCs on the wafer and using that super high quality expensive silicon to let the chips communicate with each other with a lot without losing speed in the way it usually would uh, because of large bulky cables or even just the lower quality of silicon in a motherboard. As far as I was aware until today, this is completely unprecedented. There are a few other startups like Cerebrus trying to achieve the exact same thing, but the way they do it is still a bit different, uh, but we won't go into that today. The biggest challenge facing Tesla, however, is making sure that the wafer has a 5x5 section with each SOC working flawlessly in order to make the system work the way that you know they expect it to. Given the training tile's shape with rounded edges, it is very possible that this you know represents the entire wafer and that the whole thing needs to work flawlessly. An empty wafer, as you can see in this image, does have a dark gray color like this after all, so that is most likely what it is. However, for Tesla, Wafer yield may be an issue, though considering that it only needs 120 fully functional wafers for Dojo, it should be able to pull it off. By comparison, Intel in 2014 made as many as 130,000 wafers, and we're talking about large 300 millimeter wafers, the largest that you see in this image, not the smaller ones, uh, one of which Tesla is using. Also, since the smaller wafer is not even filled to the brim as a normal wafer would be, the cost should be significantly lower, though in general, that perfect quality silicon that a wafer is made up of isn't cheap either. 
A last thing about wafers that I should mention, there has been this alternative theory that instead of leaving them on a uh, wafer, instead the chips do are cut out of a wafer and are then put onto a blank wafer. This is a sort of technology that TSMC, uh, one of the potential companies that might be fabricating this whole thing, has created, though so far those were just examples in the lab. So this would be the first example of that, but whether that is actually true or not, nobody's certain, though some people when they saw this animation and the way that Tesla announced it did assume that this is what it could alternatively be. No RAM, no shared cache. What is also unprecedented, as far as I'm aware, is a computer that does not have any RAM outside the SOC. Even a smartphone and Tesla's Hardware 3 has RAM chips outside of the SOC. Even the fastest new hard drives, to which we will get into a bit, cannot randomly access memory as fast as RAM, and cannot replace it. Theoretically, the latest PCIe 4 tech available on the market would only reach 0.5 to 3 gigabytes per second, rather than the 20 to 25 gigabytes per second that is standard for consumer computers with DDR4 RAM, or even up to 50 gigabytes per second for the next generation DDR5 RAM that is starting to roll out in data centers. When it comes to size, smartphones and consumer computers usually use 4 to 32 gigabytes of RAM and professional workstations can even reach 512 gigabytes of RAM, so that's quite a lot. So if Tesla's training tile has no RAM, what gives? Well, there is in fact an even faster tier of random memory called a cache or SRAM. This is something I also covered last time, but I'll, I'll detail it once more. DRAM, or as most people simply call it, RAM, when the SOC or the CPU calls on it, has a response time of approximately 60 nanoseconds. Whereas the L3 cache, or the on-chip SRAM, will have a response time as low as 10 nanoseconds. The largest L3 cache Intel has right now uh, is 57 megabytes, and that's on a like their top tier Xeon uh, series processor. IBM's record with their Power9 is 240 megabytes, and AMD's most powerful processors, uh, a few Epic series and some Threadrippers, have 256 megabytes of L3 cache. And by comparison, Tesla's hardware 3 chip, announced back in uh, 2019, has 64 megabytes of SRAM. Then finally, Tesla's new training node has 1.25 megabytes of high-speed RAM. Wait, what? That sounds wrong, right? Well, that is because we are talking about nodes, and 354 nodes make up a computer array. That means that a single SoC actually has 424.8 megabytes of cache memory, beating all the others that we mentioned previously. However, I don't believe the fun ends there. Considering the fact that uh, the SRAM is located directly on each node and that Tesla called it high-speed SRAM, I suspect that rather than an L3 cache, we're talking about an even faster L2 cache, even though non-shared L3 cache, the way IBM does it, is also a possibility, but a lot less likely since those caches are 10 megabytes in size, not 1.2. It's a whole different league. Yeah, and Intel, they actually have one megabyte of L2 uh, cache per core, so that is somewhat similar. Considering the size of 1.25 megabytes cache per node, I would be willing to bet that this is an L2 cache. One of the main differences between an L1 and L2 cache versus an L3 cache, uh, besides their speed and size, which we will get to in a moment, is that the L1 and L2 are usually located directly on each node slash core, whereas L3 is usually, with that exception of IBM, located elsewhere on the chip and is shared by all the cores slash nodes. In this image, you see Tesla's Hardware 3 chip. Uh, the CPU, which here is actually an ARM design, or ARM, um, is usually considered a 12-core processor, but in this case, it's actually three four-core processors. On the bottom, I highlighted what is a core, uh, what is an L1 and an L2 cache, and I left the top part empty so you can see what that looks like. So yeah, the L3 is shared by all four cores, uh, the L1 and L2 uh, is individual per core, though I must admit if you look at the top side, I don't really see that split in the L2 memory, so it might be there, 
or this is you know a more unusual example where the L2 is shared by two cores. But the way that I highlighted it at the bottom is what would be considered the norm. So if the 1.25 megabytes is an L2 cache, this would put it ahead of that Intel chip we mentioned earlier. Even though Intel's L3 cache was 57 megabytes, it has only one megabyte of L2 cache per core. However, since Intel's core count of 38 is much lower than Tesla's node count of 354, overall, the amount of cache on the Intel processor is a lot lower. Since I failed to mention it till now, by the way, uh, an L1 cache has a response time of 0.5 nanoseconds, fastest of all. An L2 cache has a response time of uh, 3 to 4 nanoseconds. And as was mentioned earlier, the L3 cache has response time of 10 nanoseconds. And of course, again, DRAM has response time of 60 nanoseconds. Next, as you can see, there is something that Tesla labeled as either one cache or I cache or small letter L cache. My bet would be that this is the fastest tier L1 cache. And more specifically, the L1 instruction cache and not the L1 data cache. Uh, most processors, as was probably obvious by now, have two L1 caches, one for instructions and one for data. Though in the past, this was one single cache that was used for both. In any case, assuming that Tesla eliminated the L1 data cache, then this is a standard size 32 kilobyte instruction cache, in which case the chip would have 11.328 megabytes of L1 cache. Double that if Tesla does have an L1 data cache and is counting them both as one in their graphic. Back to the matter at hand. Um, it was already weird enough that the Tesla training tile has no DRAM, but it gets even weirder when you realize that their SOC does not include a shared L3 cache either. It's important to keep in mind that this is a very specific system, fine-tuned to a very particular task, uh, whereas most processors have a wide array of components to be more flexible and to fit all kinds of tasks. So, as strange as the design sounds, the missing components that you would usually expect to find in an SoC might have been unnecessary and were removed, either for the sake of cost and simplicity, or they may have even been a crutch that would have slowed down system. Networking SOCs together. Now, normally each SOC sends signals via pins down into the motherboard that then get redistributed. Tesla doesn't cut the SOC out of the wafer and instead connects all the SOCs on the wafer with 72 networking nodes for a total of 16 terabytes per second, or four terabytes per edge that can then uh, connect it to a neighboring SOC. This means that each networking node on the chip is capable of 222 gigabytes per second. During the presentation, Tesla said, This is more than two times the bandwidth coming out of the state-of-the-art networking switch chips which are out there today. And network switch chips are supposed to be the gold standards for I.O. bandwidth. At first, I was skeptical of that claim, but after doing some research, they turn out to be correct. Large networking chip manufacturers like Cisco and Broadcom have so far only achieved speeds of 25.6 terabits uh, per second per chip, uh, which when converted equals 3.2 terabytes. And Tesla for the whole chip has 16 terabytes per second rather than 3.2. So there might be some other state-of-the-art chip that is more that we were not immediately able to find, but it does check out. I do see why Tesla was surprised that the golden standard was not all that great compared to what they were able to make, especially since networking is not even the primary function of this chip, whereas for networking chips, it is. The Tesla D1 chip and training tile, they just keep impressing at every single term. Now, I must say the best networking chips from Broadcom and Cisco, it's possible that they simply haven't had a need for faster chips yet, but it still seems rather ridiculous how good Tesla's D1 chip is by comparison. Networking training tiles together. Now, for the next unit of measurement, here is some good background information. A traditional hard drive with spinning disks inside that everyone owns and can easily, and it's a drive that can easily reach multiple terabytes inside of it. Uh, it's unfortunately somewhat slow. You might have already noticed that, but it has a read write speed of, you know, somewhere between 50 to 150 megabytes per second. Um, 
Also, it is important to keep in mind that we are now talking about sequential speeds, like when you're transferring files, and not the random speeds that are related to RAM. Uh, whole different thing. Then, uh, a regular solid state disk, or SSD, uh, which uses NAND flash memory, like in uh, USBs as well, and it's connected usually via a SATA port, or USB, which is then connected to SATA, uh, that is usually limited to somewhere 200 to 500 megabytes per second. Now, the newer NVMe SSDs, which are connected via an M.2 slot, can reach a speed of 8 gigabytes per second. And the very latest SSDs, which actually make use instead of a PCIe Gen 4 connection, has a theoretical limit of 64 gigabytes per second. So the fastest product available on the market only has a speed of 15 gigabytes per second so far. Then speaking of PCIe Gen 4, Tesla also uses that to connect its training tiles or wafers together. But with 40 connectors and a 32 terabytes per second bandwidth, that means that each connector enjoys a speed of 900 gigabytes per second. But how is that even possible when I literally just said that 64 gigabytes per second is the limit for PCIe Gen 4? Well, that only holds true for the largest connection available to the market, which is a PCIe Generation 4 X16 slot, as you can see in this image. Now, as Tesla has announced, they made their own custom connectors, and uh, that is how each connector gets a speed of 900 gigabytes per second. This, in essence, makes their connector, which is, you know, relatively compact, all things considered, 14 times faster than the best connector a regular motherboard has to offer. The only question is how durable it is, because an X16 connector is durable, to, uh, durable enough to endure you connecting and disconnecting things multiple times. Here, that they might have sacrificed, uh, you know, how robust it is for performance, which makes sense, because this is, you know very specific hardware for a supercomputer rather than something that Joe might put together in his garage. Tesla D1 chip specs. The D1 chip under its specifications boasts about the fact that it has 50 billion transistors. When it comes to processors, that absolutely beats the current record held by AMD's Epic Rome chip, which has 39.54 billion transistors. Though, among graphics cards, the NVIDIA uh, GA100 Ampere SoC, uh, which we mentioned earlier, still comes out on top with 54 billion transistors. Now, the fact that a 7 nanometer process has been used to fabricate the chips tells us that Tesla used either Samsung or TSMC to make it happen. Personally, I think Samsung is more likely since it is also Samsung that fabricated Tesla's hardware 3 chip. The cooling and the power. So this wasn't completely clear until later in the Q&A, though I already suspected this all along. The whole training tile is liquid cooled. Interestingly enough, they did not say water cooled, so I wonder what kind of liquid they make use of. Nonetheless, the real revelation here is how well they are able to cool this silicon wafer. Tesla has a lot of experience with power electronics and cooling, and they put that expertise to really great use here. Normally, a processor on one side has a piece of motherboard quality silicon uh, with pins that lead signals into the motherboard, which is obviously impossible to cool. On the other side is the SOC, which is covered by some thermal grease, usually not very good thermal grease either. Uh, then a metal heat spreader that makes a processor look like, you know, a metal processor you might have seen before. Then a manufacturer, a computer repair person, or PC enthusiast puts more thermal grease onto the heat spreader and then connects the smooth metal of the cooling block on top of the heat spreader, which then redirects the absorbed heat either directly into a radiator uh, with a fan or into a liquid, usually water, that then takes the heat to a larger radiator further away from the processor to which you can attach multiple fans. In the case of the Tesla training tile, uh, one side of the wafer with all the SOCs is as exposed as on a regular processor, even more actually since there is no heat spreader, and can be cooled directly. Uh, 
the other side has voltage regulators covering every SOC. So there are two innovations here. First of all, the voltage regulator is usually located on the motherboard right next to the processor, meaning that the current needs to travel through the motherboard, the socket, the pins, and the motherboard quality silicon on which the SOC is located. However, that is not all. The much bigger innovation is also the final step that makes this whole on top thing possible. Usually, the current reaches the SOC from all sides, all the sides via pins. Uh, if you've ever seen a basic old chip with lots of pins on all the sides, it's basically like that, but obviously a lot more advanced with a lot more pins. In this case, the power travels directly onto the SOC. How exactly they managed to do this is unclear, but it is rather impressive. And depending on how it was done, this might also cause less heat if the voltage can be introduced into multiple points of, of the chip, so the current does not have to travel as far. For the heat that all these voltage regulators do emit, a cooling block with some holes for connectors are all around the voltage regulators to take away as much heat from that side as well. As I said, the cooling block has holes and a single power supply unit powers all of the voltage regulators simultaneously. It plugs right in on top and right on top of that again is another cooling block to cool the power supply unit even though it looks suspiciously like a radiator. And that was it for part one, but no worries, part two will be published tomorrow, and we will start off by explaining how Dojo ended up in 11th place rather than 5th or 6th or even 1st. We will also analyze whether in the grand scheme of things this is good or bad news. Uh, we'll touch up on uh, Dojo 2.0, Hardware 4, and the software for Dojo. Now, if you like this video, then please give it a thumbs up to make sure that more people get to see it and make sure to subscribe with the bell icon to be notified tomorrow when part two goes live. Other than that, I wish you guys all a wonderful day and probably till tomorrow. See ya.